All right, so welcome everybody to our November 2nd lecture in our Wilderness Medicine series. Um, let me share our slideshow here. Um, All right. So uh, here we go. We are a uh, Gaomi, in case it's your first time. Uh, we started a few years ago uh, in order to showcase uh, and apply medical training to your future career, whether you're pre-med, uh, med students, residents, um, appendings, search and rescue. Um, I think anyone can gain appreciation for the wide breadth of emergency medicine and wilderness medicine that we have here. Um, we have, yeah, we offer these bi-weekly lectures, uh, wilderness opportunities of many kinds. We have some yearly, like, first aid trainings, that kind of thing, fellowship code cases, certificate courses is a new thing this year. Um, so if you want to join our mailing list, we've got a QR code here and also our website. Um, too far. Okay. Um, we do have social media, which was the last slide. Um, this is like an ongoing gear giveaway. We'll post in the chat a link if you want to throw your name in the hat. We got a couple things from Pit Viper donated and at the end of the semester, we'll do a drawing and uh, send you some free stuff. Here is our uh, upcoming lectures. Um, and on our website, we have recordings of past lectures. Um, we're recording this one. And then we have a few more, I think we have one more left this year. In, at the end of November with undersea and dive medicine. And then we'll take a break over Christmas and we'll be back in the spring with an exciting new panel of lectures. We're kind of putting in the works right now. Um, so so today's speaker here, Dr. Rupal Unia. Um, she's practicing neurologist in Bangor, Maine, completed her medical you training. can't see Chicago. anything. Oh, you can't see anything? No, we just have a, a black Google doc. It says it's loading, but oh. we haven't seen anything that you tried to put up. Oh no. Okay, I can try re doing it. Oh no. It seems like when you put it into the slideshow function, it doesn't work. But I can see your screen. Okay. When you yeah, I can see that. When you're doing this. Okay. Yep. Um okay, so basically, um, yeah, here's our upcoming lectures here. Um, and then I will see, here's a little bio for Dr. Rupal Unia. Um, yeah, studied in uh, Krakow, Poland, a neurology residency in vascular neurology fellowship at Rochester um, and movement disorders in New York. Wow. Um, and she's working towards her farm uh, because why wouldn't you? She currently serves as the WMS Jedi chairperson. Uh, in her leisure time, she climbs rocks, ice, skis, ice skates, hikes, bikes, camps, travels, teaches yoga, and generally enjoys life. Um, and currently learning landscape oil painting, and her bucket list item is to bike across New Zealand. So and I know, Dr. Unia, you have a couple more individuals with you. Do you want to introduce them? Sure thing. Yes, I would love to. So I'm actually going to use uh, our PowerPoint to do the introductions. Uh, I have here. I'll turn it in, hopefully. Show mode. Okay. So today, my team and I would like to discuss compassionate care in the wilderness and how to use your Jedi powers. So as you mentioned, I'm Rupal, and uh, with us here today, we have Sarah Kleinschmidt. She is an ER doc. She leads the uh, education portion of our JEDI committee, and she was an extra in the movie 127 Hours, amongst many other interesting things about Sarah. Uh, and then Rachel is a family doc in California, and she... Uh, is our mindfulness Jedi maven. She has written an article uh, all about the topics we're going to touch on today uh, that is hopefully going to be published in the WMS journal. 
stay tuned for that one. And she also is an excellent baker. So we have uh, Nadav couldn't join us today because he lives in Israel and it is 1 a.m. for him. So we will miss him, but is help put our presentation together. He is an EMT, a medical educator, and has a lot of interest in uh, cultural competence. And Sarah Granda hopefully will join us uh, still. She is a um, medical social worker and a health lawyer and also a skier. Uh, but as you can see in this photo, Sarah is, uh, she is quadriplegic. She is on a trach and she uses a wheelchair and she still does all these awesome things. Uh, so that is Sarah Granda, who hopefully will join in soon. Uh, so we wanted to start off um, with a case. So we're going to need help, uh, volunteers to participate. Um, so the first case is you are hiking. And so you can be any one of you who's not one of us. Uh, and you come across a parent who's emotionally distressed, crying, screaming, not making sense. And there is a seven-year-old child who seems to be having trouble breathing and is also screaming and crying. And so this will be uh, your chance to figure out what's going on and, and help uh, in this case. Anyone want to volunteer or should we just pick somebody? Use your little hand up button or unmute yourself and volunteer. I'll volunteer for the first one. Great. Can't even see who volunteered, but thank you. I did, Katrina. Hi, Hi Katrina. <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing so we can um, do the case. Super. So Rachel is our uh, child, and then um, Sarah is the parent, and Katrina will be our hiker to the rescue. <laughs> so you'd like to me, me to run through kind of what I would do if I arrive on the scene? Oh my yeah. gosh, please help. Can you help us? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. We need help. Please. So first thing I would come up and check scene safety, of course, in the outdoors is making sure the scene's safe for myself. Oh my God, I think he's allergic. He's dying. He's having an allergic reaction. He can't breathe. Can you please help us? Okay. And I would look at the yeah, seven-year-old who is- um, Sorry, born to my husband. <laughs> the seven-year-old who is, uh, I can see he's breathing. If he's screaming, um, I can check airway, or sorry, airway. He's screaming. So he has an airway breathing. Um, I can visually see if his we have lung rise and circulation. We can check peripheral pulses. I would also say breathe. It's so noisy. Why is it so noisy? I think he's choking. Our oh mom and child. My name's Katrina. I'm a fourth year medical student. And then I would ask mom, "What's going on?" Oh my god! I think uh, I think he's. I don't know if he's choking or if he's having an allergic reaction, but he can't breathe. He got all noisy. He's look. He's grabbing his throat or her throat. I don't know. I can't. I don't okay. Even... Was he eating prior to this? We were just we were hiking and then and then eating. He uh, we had a peanut butter sandwich. Oh my! God. It was the peanut butter, wasn't it? Oh my god! I'm Has such he a... ever had oh an allergic god. reaction to peanuts before? Uh, um, no, no. But peanuts are bad, right? They don't let them in the preschool. Oh my god! Has he eaten peanuts before himself? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and. Has he had any other symptoms besides grabbing at his throat? Well, he was all noisy. Didn't okay. he, he, he? With his breathing? Yeah. Are we still hearing noisy breathing? Yeah, no, I'm still screaming. Okay. <laughs> A little harder <laughs> over Zoom. <laughs> all right. Does he have any other medical problems? No, no. He had some rashes when he was a kid. Okay. And he also has prior asthma. Oh, yeah. And he has asthma. He has an inhaler. Okay. And prior to. How long has his symptoms been going on for? Oh, like like five minutes. Okay, and prior to that, he was well, healthy, his normal self. Yeah, yeah, we were just we were having a great day. Okay, and looking at the seven year old, I'm still hearing breathing trouble, but he still is breathing, correct? Yep, just. 
Okay. Am I hearing we audible wheezing? No. Okay. And um, no Strider. And no Strider either. Okay. I would probably advise that we should start moving towards the trailhead because I don't have anything I can treat this patient with at this time or look further um, into his case. He's not, he's not going to make it to, he can't breathe right now. How large is the seven-year-old? Can I, If he's still breathing and we can carry him out, I think we should probably transport out um, while he is audibly breathing. It's going to take us at least an hour to get back there. I don't think he's going to make it. Oh my gosh. I killed myself. I hear you. Let's also call for help at the same time. I'm hoping we have cell phone reception. Yeah. 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 Perfect. There are a couple of things you can check, right? While you're out there as a hiker. Um, and we can check his oral cavity and make sure there's nothing in his mouth that's preventing him from breathing. Great. Um, there is nothing. There is nothing. Um, I'm feeling a little rusty. Can I call phone a friend? <laughs> yeah, phone a friend. Um, Kira, you here? You, you, you're la. Uh... Yeah. Um, I guess like, have we like talked to the kid yet? Like, ask him how he's feeling. What like symptoms he's experiencing? Can he like talk to us in full sentences? I mean, I guess, sorry, it's a role play. Um, hey, like, what's great, going on, buddy? <laughs> and, yeah, I saw so. a bee. Yeah, you saw one? Was that yeah. pretty scary? Yeah, it's scary. Did you, get, did you get stung? I don't know. Uh, does anything <laughs> I hurt? I think so. Okay. Does anything <laughs> hurt? I bumped my knee. Yeah. Let's look at your knee. Knee's normal. Okay. Abrasion yeah. from like five days ago. Okay. Have you been stung by bees before? I don't know. Yeah. Um, do you want a couple take a couple deep breaths with me? Maybe you can see if you can breathe when I breathe. Ready? Ready? Okay. Breathe in. And breathe out. Yeah. Take some good yoga breaths. Yeah. How you doing? You want some water? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, look, um, I have some water. Yeah. <laughs> How well, old are you? I'm seven. Yeah. Uh, are you in second grade? I'm in third grade. Third grade. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and you like playing sports or you like drawing? What do you like to do for fun? I like football. All okay. right. And then like, hey, mom, how do you feel like your kid's doing? He's doing better. I yeah. He just he was he, he was so he was breathing so fast before. Yeah, yeah. It's super scary. And I'm glad you're you're uh, watching him closely. You got the mom instinct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Do you think we should uh, maybe start walking a little bit and seeing if how things go? We can give it a test run. Maybe you can be in charge of watching his breathing and make sure he's doing okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He seems much better to walk back to the trailhead now. Yeah, yeah. That's your job, though. You keep an eye on him, okay? And we're going to be here right with you. It's always my job. That's what I do. <laughs> Great. Good job, everyone. So let us talk a little bit about this case. So, yes, this kid was just scared of a bee, and that's why he or she was freaking out. Uh, and this was based on a real case that Nadav has experienced as an EMT. So that's where it came from. Uh, and so what we kind of wanted to demonstrate is, okay, when, when, and what you did a great job of is like, how do you calm people down? How do you take a breath and see what's really going to going on? Um, and that's, that's part of what we wanted to really talk about today as Jedi, um, because we do believe that mindfulness and um, breathing techniques and, and yoga meditation are all useful ways of uh, making people feel belonging, belongingness, inclusion, 
Uh, and if they do feel that way, that the wilderness is also a place for them, then we get a more diverse uh, crowd that's out here in the wilderness with us, which is great for everybody. So let us see, go back to my PowerPoint. So how did it feel? One question is, how did it feel when you're trying to go through this scenario and everyone's eyes are on you and um, there's two people screaming? Katrina, how did, how did you feel? Definitely stressful. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it's hard to simulate a stressful situation on Zoom, but that's what we were trying to do. Um, to say, how can we make it less stressful? Uh, so, um, yeah, so you did a good, good job of like, what did you do first? How do you introduce yourself? Scene safety. Uh, one, one question that we have talked about a little bit in our group is like, how do you address a patient? So one question is to say like, what do you prefer to be called? What's your name? What do you want me to, how do you want me to call you? And that can or cannot include pronouns. It really depends on the, the scenario. Um, if you're doing a physical exam, permission is really important. Um, that's always true, but it can be especially true in people of different cultures where rules are different regarding uh, touch. And you don't, you're never going to know everybody's rules from every culture. Uh, and so asking permission is really important. And then how did you show compassion? Uh, and that's really what we uh, want to cultivate here is that ability to kind of reduce the stress and bring out the compassion. Um, let's see. I just have a couple of cartoons here. <laughs> Um, we can talk about what is compassion. So compassion is suffering together, but more so than just suffering together, it's the um, motivation to relieve the suffering of others. So taking action is part of it. Uh, whereas empathy is more so just the suffering together without the action part. So one way in which you can be compassionate under fire is just doing simple breathing technique. This is just one option. There are many, um, but this is something that Rachel is going to lead us through and we can all do it together and just see how we feel. Hey folks. Uh, so thanks for putting up with my acting skills. Um, so we are gonna do um, an example of box breathing. So it's an inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, for four, and then hold for another four. Um, and so the idea of this is to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, kind of get you out of your limbic circuit and get you back into your body. This can be done in a high stress moment or if you are anticipating high stress, for example, um, if you're gonna go out with your search and rescue team and you kind of finished your brief and you're getting set up to maybe go and find somebody, it might be skillful to have kind of a mindful moment for yourself just to kind of like check in with your body, how you're feeling. Um, and then also highly recommend for uh, you know, the debrief period for after um, a high stress situation, like a code or, um, or a challenging case or, uh, or a difficult rescue, or actually any rescue, I think all rescues are stressful. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and do that together. So uh, let's, let's all take a just a regular inhale, and exhale kind of all the way out. And then we're gonna inhale slowly for four, two, three, four, hold for four, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, 
four, hold for four, two, three, four. And um, we can repeat that. You can do several cycles of box breathing. I would recommend doing a few. It takes a little while to bring the heart rate down. Um, but maybe try that at home and see if you notice anything. There's lots of different ways to do breathing exercises at different rates of hold and inhale and how long do you hold it and all of that. Um, but this one's pretty simple. That's why we like it. It is also used by the military. Yeah. So here, you know, I'm a neurology nerd. So here's the neurobiology of why this works. So every time you hold your breath, you increase the circulating carbon dioxide. You stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. So the rest and digest mode, so that vagus nerve gets activated and you calm the sympathetic fight or flight response. Your serum cortisol goes down, your heart rate goes down, your blood pressure lowers, and you're just in a better frame of mind to be helpful to someone else. So highly recommend practicing techniques to focus and calm the mind. All right, I think we're moving on to case number two, indeed. So, uh, Skier of color experiences a crash on the ski hill. You are ski patrol and called to the scene to assist. So I'm going to stop the share and then I can, I've already tortured my colleagues with acting so I can um, do the same. I'll pretend to be this skier and someone else can rescue me. Any volunteers? for a rescue ski patroller. I'll put your I'll hands up. Uh, <laughs> my name is Charlie, I'm a third year medical student. Thank you for coming to my rescue, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so I am skiing along and I collide with someone else and everything goes everywhere. It's a yard sale. Um, so you're in ski patrol, you get called over to check on me. Okay. Um, so yeah, I ski down and I see you and I guess I'll first shout out. It's like, hey, how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, does anywhere, uh, does it hurt anywhere right now? Um, yeah, my, my leg really hurts. My right leg, it's just, it feels terrible. Okay. Do you remember what happened to you? I just crashed into this other person and, and now I don't know. I... Okay. Gotcha. Are you able to breathe? Okay. Breathing okay. Okay. Um, all right. Well, listen, we're uh, going to make sure that uh, we'll take a look at your leg. We're going to get you uh, down off the mountain and get you some medical help. All right. How does that sound to you? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, I'm feeling like really exhausted now. And Okay. Um, well, uh, are you still there? Can you still hear me? Hear you. Okay. Um. Uh, I need you to uh stay with me. All right. Uh, can you tell me your name? I'm Rupal. Okay. Uh, and then uh, are you able to move your leg at all? Ow! Oh my God. Ow. Okay, we won't do that. All right. Thanks for trying. All right. So uh, while we're do doing this, uh, does one of you want to be our omniscient voice, Sarah or Rachel, so you can tell us what else is happening? Uh, yeah, I can help with that. Okay, so um, you... So I'm going to recap if, if that's okay. So you noticed the scene is safe. You went to talk to the patient. They're in pain. They kind of are a little out of it. 
you had to ask her to stay with you. Uh, and when you asked them to move their leg, it hurt really bad. And maybe what's an, what's a next step that you can do to assess the, maybe the reason why there's a change in the level of consciousness. Um, uh, check to see if there's any blood or, um, just, uh, look over or, uh, like do a quick physical exam. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what do, what does the physical exam start with? Uh, mental status. I guess. Uh, okay. Okay. So you notice that, uh, that Rupal is awake but somnolent and you've had to ask Rupal to wake up what's next um she's able to uh move uh to command um okay yep okay so responsive to commands spontaneous uh, spontaneous verbal and right. mainly spontaneous with the eye opening but maybe we're kind of like tired right Mm -hmm. What about, um, how about if I give you some vital signs? Okay. Okay. So you don't have a blood pressure cuff with you, even though you're ski patrol, you may or may or may not have a cuff, but the heart rate is 130 and it's tacking along pretty well. I'm going to say that you checked the radial pulse. Um, and it's a little like it's a little weaker than you would expect, maybe one plus. And uh, the cap refill on the hand, because you've checked radial pulse so far, is like maybe three seconds, maybe four, a little slower than you would expect. And the respiratory rate, we'll say, is mid 20s. Okay. Okay. What do you want to do next? Um, so with a weak pulse and tachycardic, I'm worried that there might be some acute blood loss somewhere. Um, so um, yeah, I, I would do a gross inspection to see if there's any uh, blood anywhere, first of all. Okay, so what are you gonna say to Rupal? Um, okay, Rupal, um, I'm worried that there might be, um, you might've had some blood loss. Um, is it okay if I uh, check you out to see if there's any blood loss anywhere? Uh, where are you going to touch me? Um, so I'm probably going to, um, I don't know, uh, take off your jacket and, uh, see if there's any blood anywhere. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's okay. 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 So you, um, so you've asked Rupal, is it okay if I help you remove your jacket? And we are uh, lucky enough that it's a two-piece ski suit. So we unzip the top part and we don't see any blood anywhere. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and then um, you mentioned your leg was hurting. Uh, I'm worried that um, there you might have a fracture and there might be blood along with that. Um, so I uh, would like to see if there is blood in the area. And if there is, I might be able to, I don't know, maybe apply a tourniquet or something. Um, is it all right if I uh, check out that area? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll probably have to cut off your pants in order to check. Yeah. So before you would do that, what else could you do? like before removing the uh to see if there's blood. any blood around the area uh how about if i give you another set of vital signs okay sure. okay so uh so you didn't see any blood in the upper torso area and uh, like, yep. uh no <laughs> gross blood to the back of the head um or to the face so uh, normocephalic atraumatic to the like 
neck up. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll give you that the pupils are equal round and reactive. Uh, and then the heart rate is now 140s, thready at the radial pulse. And uh, you're going to go ahead and remove the, sh the boots and check the pedal pulses. Okay. And on the left, you get 140s and thready. And on the right, you get no pulse. Okay. Now what? Yeah. So I guess um, uh, it's probably going to be the right side. So okay. uh, I would ask if, I, if it's all right for me to cut off the the right ski pant leg okay do you think that's um, something you want to do on the hill um i'm not sure when the right timing for it is or if i would just start off by applying a turn i'm not sure okay so okay. Not I think this is, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. We kind of, we kind of, this is when we set this up, we were like, let's talk about what we would do medically. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so you do, you did great. Um, we're going to say that you realize that there's no pulse to the right foot. And, uh, fortunately you have resources coming and we're going to go down the hill to, uh, to the clinic. And that's the end of the scenario. Oh, okay. We okay. were able to extricate Rupal off of the hill and, uh, eventually blood flow will be restored to the foot and they will live to ski another day. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Rupal, if you want to take back over. Well, we just, the, one of our um, points that we wanted to make was like, okay, at some point you have to call, call somebody for help. And, and so a, no one to do that. And B what happens when you call for help is this patient becomes really agitated and is like very um, angry or seems like they really don't want you to call somebody. And so then our question is like, how do you decide why that is? And in this case, obviously this patient is losing a bunch of blood through internal bleeding. So you can't see it, but it's happening. And so they are becoming more agitated. Um, but that's something that you would have to try to figure out while on the hill is like, what is happening here? Why are they becoming more agitated? Um, one of the scenarios could be that like, maybe I'm uh, someone without documentation and I'm worried that you're gonna go call ICE on me or something and, and send me back to my country. Gotcha. So uh, those are just kind of, kind of things to think about, but really um, the, the idea here behind these scenarios is not that you as the third year medical student are going to know all the answers to what to do, but it's more so like, how do you think about it? How do you calm yourself? How do you become more focused and able to kind of ask the right questions? And so that that's what we wanted to see is like, how do you feel after having done the breathing exercise? So now you've learned the thing and then use it. And how does it change how you are able to help somebody? Turns out it's pretty hard to make a differential diagnosis if your heart rate is 140. Makes sense. Yeah. On the spot. <laughs> yeah. So good job. Thanks. Thank you so much for participating. So let's just do our screen share again. Okay. So really what we wanna do is have an open discussion with you guys. Like, How does it feel when you incorporate some mindfulness? How do you meet people where they are? How does it make you become a better doctor? And how does it help you include other people that may otherwise be excluded? So this is where you all come off mute. Tell me your thoughts. I'll start the discussion by sort of jumping in and just saying, I think like we try to make that scenario wildernessy, but you guys are going to see these sorts of episodes 
like every day that you're in a clinical practice. Um, right. So I work in the emergency department and like every shift, I have a patient who is trying to leave for some reason against medical advice. Right. And trying to figure out like compassionately, like what is going on for that patient? Why are they, why are they sort of like resistant or stressed by what I think is a very reasonable care plan? Um, and that's something that you're going to see in every setting that you work in, um, whether it's like wilderness, pre-hospital, emergency, inpatient, even like outpatient where you have a patient who's just like, yeah, I don't take that medicine, right? <laughs> um, and so I think we can dig in a little bit both to like, what's our reaction in those moments and also like what might be going on for the patient in that interaction. One of the things that we come up against a lot is that the parent, the patient comes back to you, they have not done what you said they should do. And so what are the barriers? You know, why is this patient not following your instructions and taking the medicine you thought will be the best for them and all that stuff? Instead of just saying, you should really take that, you have to dig a little deeper and, and find out the why, where where is everyone coming from? So I have a fair number of patients who just don't want to take more drugs and they're more interested in holistic treatment and naturopathic treatment. And so for me to just push my own views on them is not helpful. It's better for me to say, okay, you don't want to take a statin for your cholesterol. Well, did you know there's a supplement called red yeast rice that you can take instead? And they're all over it. And that's, still helps lower the cholesterol and sometimes has fewer side effects. So that is one example of, you know, just figuring out where people are and it's not always going to be in the same frame of mind that you are. And so you've got to kind of meet them halfway. I had a patient that um, has latent tuberculosis. It was that it was recently diagnosed, but probably exposed a very, very long time ago. And unfortunately, the clinician who found this explained it to the patient by saying that what they meant was it's really, really common to have these exposures in places where there's fewer resources, such as the rural community in Mexico where this patient is from. Um, but the patient heard that as all you Mexicans have tuberculosis, which he didn't appreciate. And so he was like, this doctor is full of it. I'm not taking that. So, um, you know, came back to my primary care clinic and kind of told me that story and I kind of asked him about like, well, where are you from? And is it possible that there were people around you with tuberculosis when you were a kid? And he's like, oh yeah, I do remember, you know? So I kind of like dug into his social history with him a little bit and then explained that this is a, this is a bug that can kind of live in you for a really, really long time. And when we find it, it's still worth treating because then it prevents it from turning into the thing that you saw, you know, your community members suffer from. And so at the end of the day, he did agree to go ahead and take the rifampin, but, um, you know, it was just a, a different way of explaining the same thing in the same treatment course. But this patient just has had a lot of frustration in the hands of the American medical system and, um, and is very sensitive to generalizations, even though it probably wasn't meant that way. Um, so like Rupal said, kind of getting to the heart of like, what's the barrier, what is the barrier here? Like, how do, how do I help you be better rather than like, how do I make you do what I want? Yeah, I think something that was eye-opening for me when I first started medical school was that like, even among my college educated friends, family, um, like the health literacy was pretty low honestly. And, um, so yeah, even, yeah. Cause I mean, like we, we expect that the, like a, a pretty large proportion of the population, like, oh, like they, like we need to like really make like it accessible to them, but even to like people who I'd expect to under, to be able to understand these concepts, like, oh, I studied economics. I have no idea. Like, even though I have like a PhD, it's like totally unrelated. So
what are some ways uh, if if you have practiced mindfulness, what are some ways that you've practiced it and do you find that it's skillful in your current um, engagement? Her computer's not being very mindful right now. It looks like her internet dropped off for a sec. But I think we can still um, discuss the question. So has anyone ever used mindfulness or had moments where it seems like this might be helpful? Uh, someone says preparing for an exam. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is definitely helpful. And also when you're in the exam, stress can make you think less clearly. So it is a great time to practice those breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Larry says after the incident. I know in um, training and then passing boards, I had to take oral exams, um, right? Which is like among the most stressful ways to do it of like having to stand as, you know, in my surgery clerkship and stand in front of someone and explain something. Um, and that was definitely a time to use like the box breathing. Um, we're getting another vote for after everything happens, but before debriefings with my coworkers. You can do it pretty easily, simply, quickly, and while things are, like, while shit is hitting the fan, you can take a breath. Like, just taking a breath can totally change the trajectory, the outcome of what's about to happen, so. Yeah, I definitely plan to use it, like, learning new procedures in uh, residency. Yeah. And as a someone who I did vascular neurology. So that's a lot of code strokes, which means like every time that you get called to one of these things, your mind is racing, like what is happening? What am I going to do about it? Are they a TPA candidate? Are they, are, am I going to need to call into vascular, all these things. And so that's the time to, that I, I'm in the elevator breathing <laughs> and thinking. Because showing up to one of those, showing up to anything panicked doesn't help your patient either. Uh, but really being able to calm them down and like you did during this scenario, having the patient breathe with you. So that's another way in which you can use it uh, so that they can also reap the benefits. I definitely use some of these techniques during difficult phone calls, um, right? Which I think is as often like with colleagues <laughs> as it is um, with the patients. I don't know if any of you have experienced like even, you know, calling a hospital to try and get the medical records for your patient, um, right? And sometimes I just, I'll put myself on mute for a second um, and just take a deep breath or you know, while you're sitting there on hold for the fourth time, like do a quick stretch, right? Do something that sort of grounds me back in my body um, and can be sort of calming and reorienting when it's like, it's really easy to just focus on like, but they won't give me the thing I need. Um, yeah, when you're on the phone with the insurance company, for sure. <laughs> yeah, the prior authorization and they call you and then put you on hold. <laughs> Welcome back, Rachel. We missed you for a second there. I'm sorry, my internet is being rude. Um, I, I second what you said, 
Sarah, about, um, you know, any, any interaction, whether it's with colleagues or patients or anything like that, a lot of this comes down to actually self-compassion and taking care of ourselves and recognizing when we need a break. We're really, really good at giving of ourselves in medicine. We're really good at um, repressing our emotions, repressing our bodies. I mean, literally just kind of like asking the body, like, Hey, do you need to go to the bathroom right now? Cause it's been, how long has it been? How much water have you had? Just, I know that that sounds like silly. Um, but giving yourself permission to take care of yourself is so, so important. Um, I think that medical education has gotten a little bit better about this. Uh, but you know, this system, it, it's built to crush and, uh, you know, our, our greatest act of resistance is to not be crushed. So, um, finding a way to have some kind of, um, mental health practice, some kind of mindfulness practice, um, so that we can check in with ourselves and, uh, and recognize when we are safe to even participate in something like a rescue or a high intensity situation? Is this going to be safe for me? And I think these are important questions to ask. Yeah, um, I was on a search and rescue team in Bozeman and we had a rescue where one of our own teammates um, had, or the two, two teammates were involved and one actually died. Um, and then the other was like gravely injured and there were I was like really impressed by the ability of some of our teammates to kind of hold themselves back from the rescue because they were, they would have been placed themselves at too much risk. Um, and then there it was a, in contrast to some of the other teammates who maybe needed to be held back by the, like the chief um, to make sure that they, uh, they didn't get themselves in over their head. Yeah. Great observation on that. What kind of mindfulness resources are you all using right now, if any? Uh, one app I use is uh, Clarity, or I think it was called Thought Diary. Where oh, you just, that's a good one. Um, yeah, you just kind of log your thoughts, and then um, in the course of it, it kind of um, asks you questions and helps you uh, think about your thoughts in a different way. Um, and I know Headspace is also one that's been recommended, but I haven't used that myself too much. But, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of a headspace, but I've never used it either. I think it, at least back when I tried it, they had like 10 free meditations and they're sort of like intro to mindfulness meditation. Um, so consider checking that out um, because I, I think they still have some that are free. Um, I currently use 10% Happier um, and they do have a free version and a subscription version. Um, the podcast is also really good because they, and you can just listen to the podcast. You don't have a subscription for it. And they do a great job of interviewing a lot of really diverse persons. Some of them are really interesting. Yeah. Headspace. Um, so Headspace and 10% Happier, I would say are probably my favorite. Insight Timer uh, is a little bit interesting to use. Um, I find it to be a little bit cluttered, the app, but they have lots of free um, recordings and live events that they do that are meditations. And you can also set up 
uh, you can set up your own timer um, with like background music and like chimes. You can set a chime on the minute. You can set a chime at the halfway part, halfway point. So if you don't really want somebody to talk talking to you, you just want like some timers so you can just sit quietly and observe your thoughts. Um, yeah. Oh, thanks, nice. RuPaul. I think um, I think we also got a recommendation from Charlie for uh, what was it? Clarity. Mm -hmm. I've had some people come back and say that they like the Calm app. That's got some more guided meditations and a lot of like sleep soundscapes and things like that. Yeah, great point, Larry, about, um, about uh, you know, kind of pre-hospital community and peer support. That's good. Um, most counties, if you're working for search and rescue, will have um, like a so social worker or a counselor that they can connect you to if you go through something that's really, really challenging um, and they're specifically oriented towards that. A lot of them would be familiar with... Uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what law enforcement experiences and similar type of situations. So, um, yeah, so in folks... a lot of cases we have, we have critical incident stress debrief teams to come in yeah. for bad incidents, but for the day-to-day -day stuff, it's usually the person sitting next to you, you know, is, yeah. is, is your debrief. Um, and because it, in a lot in EMS and pre-hospital, there's, you don't typically have the time going into the incident to, Right. To, to center yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's all after the fact. Yeah. I, I mean, I will endorse that the majority of my like mindfulness or mental health practice is done on my own time. It's, this mm -hmm. is, it's not something that's through my organization. We didn't really have a whole lot of it through my medical school, a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, and the search and rescue team that I was on they told us that it was available, but uh, it, you know, you had to, you had to reach out right. to make that happen. So, um, so yeah, pretty much everything I do is just on my own time. I will challenge a little bit that it all has to happen afterwards. I think one thing, mm -hmm. right, this is a practice and it's a muscle. Right. You know, think of it as sort of like a mental space to go back to. Um, and so if you're able to do something like breathing exercises on a somewhat regular basis or just get that experience. I think it does make it much easier to like, as you're driving to the call, right. Mm -hmm. As you're hiking, as you're pausing and getting out your gear um, to do a quick breath and it'll bring you back to that mental space that you already are familiar with. Right. Obviously you're not going to learn how to do box breathing in the middle of a call. Um, but I think it still can be a really helpful tool as things are happening, mm -hmm. um, if you sort of have that ongoing practice. Uh, there's a there's a great article um, by last name Epstein, E-P-S-T-E-I-N. Uh, it's called the mindful or a mindful practice. And Epstein talks about uh, medical encounters or like a clinical encounter as uh, kind of like a musical performance where when a cellist or a pianist is giving a performance, they're doing the thing, mm -hmm. but they're also listening to their own performance and changing it as like, as they get moment by moment feedback for um, how does it sound to them? Do they want to play it a little bit differently? Maybe how does that, I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but like, how does it sound? How does it feel? And then Epstein kind of makes the parallel to in a clinical encounter, um, one can sort of develop a, um, like an observer. I'll stir again. <laughs> All right. Well, we do try and keep these to an hour. Um, so I don't know. We have a couple minutes left if you have any extra pearls for us. 
or if anyone has any questions, we're happy to try to answer. Um, I have a question. How about uh mindfulness while delivering bad news? Um, like in like doesn't that like extreme scenario? I've heard uh some TED talks of paramedics telling uh the person that you know they are gonna die from these injuries, but like doesn't have to be that extreme. But um, yeah. What what about like delivering bad news and and still keeping that in mind? And that is something that you are going to have plenty of practice doing is delivering bad news. Um, you know, neurologists keep tissue boxes because we are often delivering news that makes people cry. Uh, and, and you don't necessarily have to go in with a certain plan of how, how to do it because everyone is so different. It, this is where it's really helpful for you to exercise your compassion that you have uh, cultivated. And just to say like, here's the thing. And uh, particularly in the United States, I found that being direct and upfront about it is the most helpful way not to sugarcoat anything or tiptoe around it. Um, but just to, instead of overloading the patient with a bunch of information, is just to kind of check in with yourself and with them and say like, what is their reaction? And like, let's be um, aware of what really is happening. Like, how are they feeling? How are they reacting? Do I need to give them a minute? Do they need more information? All that sort of thing. Uh, but it is, it is an art. And also- Go ahead. Oh, sorry. And also um, checking in with yourself, you know, kind of before, during and after about how are you emotionally experiencing this delivery of bad news? Because, you know, if it's someone, whether it's someone that you know well or someone that you just met, delivering bad news is hard um, and you're going to have emotions about it. And, um, everybody chooses their own way to be with this. Um, I find that, you know, if also I'm family practice, so this is mostly people that I know. Um, but I find that, you know, if I shed a tear with the patient, they don't mind. And maybe they even appreciate it. You know, if it's something that's really hard being in solidarity with them, you know, you don't have to bottle it and then do catharsis later, but you can, right? And so there's there's a whole range of, um, of humanity that's available to you. Um, you know, we're not news delivery robots. And so, um, you know, and your, uh, your medical school will probably take you through and certainly your residency program will take you through some like observed clinical experiences, OSCEs and stuff like that. Um, uh, for ways to do the delivery of the bad news, but in terms of the mindfulness, that's uh, yet another skill that we get to practice, practice, practice. So I actually have to sign off because I have another appointment right now. So thank you all so much for including me. And uh, I look forward to maybe meeting again sometime. Thanks, Rachel. And thank, thank you, you everyone for participating. We're so thrilled to be asked to do this session for you. And, uh, you know, we're always available for questions. If you um, want to email us, I'll put my email in the chat here. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and we're always interested in people joining the WMS Jedi Committee. So please reach out. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for you guys for your wonderful presentation. Um, yeah. Reach out if uh, you guys have any questions. Thanks. Thanks for joining everyone.